Welcome back. I'm Tim Erlander with the Republican Roundtable, and we're back again. Uh, my co-host, Mark Sullivan, is not here. He's unfortunately indisposed. But we do have our special guest, E.J. Haust. Do I have that pronounced right? Almost. It's oh, Haust. Haust. Okay. <laughs> but you tell me everybody else mispronounced it, too, so Everyone I feel does. Bad. I answer to anything. Well, that's great, E.J. Thank you for coming, and sure. thank you for being interviewed. Uh, before we get started, you know, I, on some of the more substantive stuff, I think people are going to know who you are and what your background is. Sure. Now, I guess you've been on radio, so there may be people who know more about you than I do. But <laughs> for those who don't, let's sure. let's get the let's sure. get some of the bios. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being on today. Um, I. Uh, I haven't lived in Minnesota my whole life, so my story starts actually in Massachusetts. I grew up in Massachusetts and remember growing up and hearing my parents call it Taxachusetts all the time. Um, moved to Florida, so I've lived in Florida, and then I scattered around some southern states, uh, graduated from the University of South Florida, uh, go Bulls, and, um, and then went on to get married, have children, and um, lived in Alabama for a short time, lived in Georgia for a very short time, and then moved on our way up here to Minnesota. What so. brought you to Minnesota? Well, it wasn't the weather. That's for certain. Um, I'm no. a Florida girl at heart, and I, I really like um, warm winters, so this has been a challenge for me. Um, I love the fall, though. Beautiful colors and, and mm -hmm. fantastic. My husband's job, obviously. Okay. Um, you know, we were a young family, and I have three beautiful children. How old are they? I have they're 14, 12, and eight now, almost nine. So, yep, three three great kids, and a husband of almost 15 years here. It'll be 15 years in a few weeks. Well, that's so neat. it's been uh, quite a ride. We've lived kind of all over, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the experiences have been phenomenal and it's kind of introduced me to lots of different ways of life and how people live in uh, different parts of the country. It's um, it's interesting. You know, I think that the folks on the East Coast a lot of times feel as though everybody lives the way they do and you come to the Midwest and they don't understand why everyone doesn't live the way they do. So I've had an, a unique perspective of seeing mm -hmm. different parts of the country. Well, that's great. Uh, how do you like Minnesota now? I do love it. Okay. I do love it. I, I um, complain in the spring. Um, without fail, you'll hear, hear me whining on Twitter and Facebook and to anybody who will listen that I just want it to be warm by about May. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I, had a, uh, I ran into a snowfall on May 2nd, so I, oh, I can yeah. understand your feelings. Uh, when you got to wear a parka to your kid's softball game in June, that's a problem for me. <laughs> um, but you know what? I mean, you can't beat the, the summers here, July, August, absolutely stunning. And fall is my favorite. Okay. I really love the, the colors and the smells and the pumpkins. It's it's nice. Other than politics, do you have an occupation? Uh, no, other than well, other than mother, of that's, course. That's you know, um, full time one. mom and and mm -hmm. wife, um, and then of course I'm a campaign strategist and kind of social media guru. I also dabble in writing and radio. Okay, how uh, how did you get interested in politics? Well, that's a pretty loaded question. You got time for that? Um, I uh, give me the short version. I'll give you the short version. In 2008, we had just moved to Minnesota, and I was watching the primaries uh, rather closely. And when I tell this story, I think most people assume uh, that I'm going a different path than I am. But in the last minute and 30 seconds of one man's speech at his party's convention, I heard, "If you're not happy with what's going on right now, get off your couch and do something about it." Um, obviously, I'm paraphrasing, but it was John McCain, who now I could probably um, disagree with as much as I would President Obama, right? But those words were nonpartisan. What he said in the last minute and 30 seconds was, get up and do something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did. I started getting involved in local campaigns. I started uh, cheering on and rooting for those people that uh, had the same values I did. Where DeBose do you live? Uh, south of the cities. I'm in uh, Southwest Metro. Okay. Yep. And uh, pretty conservative. I'm in con uh, 
Congressional District 2. And so um, I'm in five, so I, I, you're luckier okay. than I am. You have my least favorite representative. I'm sorry, Mr. Ellison, but um, not my favorite. I probably disagree with him more than anyone else in the entire House of Representatives. But mm -hmm. um, I just felt as though that was a calling for me, that I, this is something I'm interested in. I did graduate with a degree in communications and um, very interested in public speaking and, mm -hmm. um, and that sort of thing. And so fell into politics because I decided to get involved. Okay, now I understand you've been on a radio some. I have. Okay, I how did you get into that? Uh, you know what, sometimes it's just a matter of who your friends are and um, where your interests lie. I, I ended up uh, meeting some of the folks from AM Talk Radio and a couple of different stations and mm -hmm. was a guest to talk about some of the things I was writing about on examiner.com and conservative daily news. And so um, that kind of spiraled into, hey, would you be a guest host? And so I've guest hosted on uh, AM 1280 as well. So. Good, good experiences there. How often there. do you guest host? You know, it depends on who wants to go on vacation and who, when the twins are playing and that sort of thing. Um, okay. But as often as I can is probably the best answer. Okay, what other things do you do politically? Politically, um, campaign strategist. I enjoy helping good candidates win elections. Um, not so much the speech writing type, but more uh, the messaging type. And, and I enjoy looking at who the message is getting to and what kind of language we can use to get there. I think a lot of times um, our candidates don't use social media in the right way. Um, for instance, on you Twitter. You noticed. I noticed. Um, and it goes both ways, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. I think a lot of times candidates think this is a, an advertising tool when really social media should be used as a social tool. As a, as a means to promote, you know, we were talking before the show even began about how important it is to meet someone face to face. Um, we should be using social media to get our candidates face to face with constituents. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, rather than saying, hey, had a great time at the ribbon cutting, I kind of push our candidates and our campaigns and our party to use it to say, hey, come meet me at this particular event. Um, would love to hear your opinion on X. And so I'm trying to drive those candidates and campaigns that I'm helping to use language and social media in a different way. Can I presume that these are mostly legislative candidates? Legislative candidates, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and certainly anybody within the party. I was on a, a BPOU executive board down in uh, Prior Lake for, um, for some time. And I've been elected delegate in the past. I didn't mm -hmm. run this last time. Um, but I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us that we, we can't sit on our couch. If we, if we just sit there and do nothing, um, then we really have no room to complain. Uh, so vote and get involved. And mm -hmm. if you've got the time like I do, go ahead and make a career out of it, right? Well, sounds great. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. You sure. must have opinions as to what's going on right now in the state and the national you level. <laughs> you like to give us some of them? What, what do you think Absolutely. of our... Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's start with an easy one. Like, okay. Uh, what, what do you think of our governor? Of our governor? Yeah. Well, I don't think he's running next time. Uh, I know that's kind of a rumor that's floated out there. I'm, I'm rather disappointed, though, in the governor for a couple of reasons. One, and first and foremost, is I think that he and the rest of the Democrats in the legislature took this one-party rule way too far. Um, I'm disappointed in the fact that they paid back their political friends and those campaign contributions in the way that they did um, and really overreached and, and took too many liberties, I think. Um, taking you know credit for the school shift. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't do that. First of all, it's law that you have to pay the school shift back, and it was thanks to the Republican budget that got you there. So I'm uh, very disappointed that it became such a, a political game and, and a paybacksmanship that I um, really can't, I can't get behind. And that's kind and of that's, what Democrats do, though, when they get elected. I think they? so. I think so. And, um, you know, it couldn't be more evident. You asked about the governor. What about um, Secretary of State Mark Ritchie and what he's doing right now with these voter rolls and, yeah, and electronic? Choice. It's awful. It's mm -hmm. absolutely awful um, that, that there isn't more outrage over that, although I'm sure he's taking advantage of a crisis now with the government shutdown at a national level to use his role as Secretary of State in a way that he really should not be using it. Bypassing the legislature, no matter who is in charge, is a bad idea. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think most Minnesotans, if they knew that, would, would say the same thing. Now, that's not a partisan thing. If you overreach, then you, know, you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my opinion, I think both Governor Dayton and Mark Ritchie need to go. 
Well, I felt that way for ever since they got elected. <laughs> right. <laughs> I couldn't wait for them to I leave agree. until they got in the door. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Okay. What about our any opinion of our state legislature? Well, currently, um, I did a piece on Conservative Daily News. It was actually a series some months mm -hmm. ago, um, shortly after the last election, about the paybacks. I mentioned how they're just paying back their political friends. Um, we see it on the national level all the time, right, where um, certain unions get a, a break from Obamacare. Or big businesses, that. Big businesses don't have to comply with their mandates, but individuals like you and me, well, yeah, we're going to be stuck with this individual mandate when it comes to Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, which couldn't be more ill-named, could it? Yeah. Um, so from a state level, though, we saw very much the same thing on a not-so-smaller scale. We saw millions and millions of dollars pumped in from all over the country um, for political purposes and, and for campaign wins. Um, unions were just absolutely unbearable. I mean, the millions of dollars. Uh, Sandy Pappas in the Senate received millions of dollars from SEIU and uh, AFSCME. AFSCME, of course, being the public. Mm -hmm. um, I know where they are. Yep, they're the public union. And then SEIU, which is the service employees yeah. uh, union. Both of those um, unions are, in fact, huge recipients of new uh, new members because of the child care provider, and I like to call them small business that owners, the, right? That was one of the bills that laws just I've ever heard the passed. most outrageous. And I think that um, from a messaging standpoint, the Republicans unfortunately really missed um, missed the boat there. Um, we should have called them business owners right from the get go and demanded that they stop calling them child care workers. Yeah. These were small business owners. Mm -hmm. These are women, mostly women, That's right. who are running businesses out of their homes. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk about a war on women, there it is right there. Yeah, right. Um, but when it comes back to the larger point, which was this was such a payback to those unions that helped get people like Sandy Pappas reelected mm -hmm. and those throughout, really throughout the Democrats, um, Led, Democrat led legislature throughout the entire state. You know something, AJ? That's the way Democrats have been doing ever since I can remember. That's it's the, it's really that's unfortunate. Yeah. Yep, and and you would know better than I. Obviously, I haven't been in Minnesota um, very long, but I've done a lot of reading on it, and the last several years have been extremely eye-opening, mm -hmm. um, and and really tried to dig into the brains of people like you that know so much more about it than I do, so that I can uh, kind of merge the two, right? Merge this this new voter, the whether it's a transient like myself into Minnesota or. Um, young people who are just coming out of high school who are new voters, we need to start reaching those people. And, um, you know, these are the issues that if they're given the facts, they will care about. No one thinks it's a good idea to unionize business owners. No one. And mm -hmm. the part that was missed in all of that is it's the low-income people that they claim to be helping that are going to be the real um, victims in all of this because they won't have some place to go to get good quality child care like they have before. It was almost mm -hmm. like the, the Affordable Care Act, right? If mm -hmm. you like your doctor, you can keep it. If you like your child care provider, you can keep it. Not necessarily. Yeah. And these child care providers will say, you know what, no, I, I don't want to be a member of the union and therefore their rates, I mean, rates are going to skyrocket here for these folks. It's going to be really, really awful in the next coming years. I know. I'm kind of glad I got my own child well raised and He's 41 now, so okay. <laughs> he's well past the... Well, I'm sure grandchildren are in the future, and, you know, that's... Doesn't look, not it's, this time. It's just awful that we've got um, such a situation where we're leaving the state mm -hmm. and the country, for that matter, um, right. in such a situation for our children and our grandchildren. I don't think it's fair. They talk about fairness all the time on the other side. Fairness would be giving everyone a clean play, playing field, a level mm -hmm. playing field. Level playing field means no special favor, favors for anybody. Um, and, and fairness would be giving our kids a, a clean slate and not saddling them with, it's almost $60,000 worth of debt that they owe right now mm -hmm. um, just for being born in the United States. That's about the size of it. Yep. I never thought when I was young that we'd see a debt at $17 trillion. $17 trillion. You know, when I was growing up, and this was a long time ago, uh, <clears throat> I thought a deficit of $10 billion was just huge. Right. Now it's chump change. Can you believe uh, it? I never thought that would happen. Uh, now they talk about $10 billion as it's only 
10 yeah, billion that's dollars. Right. I, where are we now as a country if we think only ten billion dollars? It's awful. It's absolutely awful. Um, and you know, I've heard many folks say that uh, twenty billion, or excuse me, twenty trillion is the absolute tipping point. That's the point of no return. Mm -hmm. I say I don't want to get there. Let's not find out if that's we'll find the case out what or we're not. Right? Have. Yeah, right. I agree with that completely. Right? I don't think our present president agrees. I don't think he gives a hoot about the debt. No, I don't think so either. In fact, um, if you look at his his statements of past. Um, read his books. Did you read his books? No. Uh, you should. I think it should be required reading. Everyone should read Dreams from My Father. Um, remember, Dreams from My Father, who was a communist, by the way, um, not Dreams of My Father. And that's significant. Words matter. And that's why language is such a big thing for me. Um, I really focus on the words that people are using and why they use them uh, so that we can reach more people and, and help spread the truth because honestly, the truth has no agenda. It, the truth is the truth because it is. Um, and so if we can kind of get to a point where we share facts, we share figures, we share, read the bills once in a while, mm -hmm. um, I think that we'll have a much better shot at taking over the legislature on the Republican side with good Republicans, with good conservative candidates that can actually get some stuff done to reduce not only our national debt, certainly we want that in D.C., but to reduce the burdens we have here on Minnesotans as well. Speaking of Minnesotans, uh, yes. we were before the show started, we were talking about uh, what's the name of our local Obamacare? Obamacare, Minsure. Minsure, yeah. Okay, so for the viewers who don't know. Okay, now know, this, is a six, this is the 16th of October. October. And this has been open for since two weeks, two weeks and basically two days. Extra. Right. Right. Um, so here, here's the, the deal for the folks who don't know. Um, Obamacare is rolled out at a federal level through a website they're calling an exchange. Right. Yeah. Um, and then it's also rolled out at the state level with state exchanges. Right. Governor Dayton was one of the first to sign that pen and say, we cannot wait to rubber stamp everything that the president has done. So off we go into these MinSure exchanges. That's what they're called for mm -hmm. Minnesota Shore, right? Essentially, what you're supposed to do is go to this website and sign up for an approved health care program, health care insurance program um, that's been approved by the Department of Health and Human Services and then approved by the state, um, being, being deemed worthy enough um, you're supposed to sign up and, and purchase this health care. Mm -hmm. If you don't purchase health care insurance, you will be fined. That's important to note. Yeah. That is the individual mm -hmm. mandate. Most people don't know that. So you go onto this website and you're supposed to be able to sign up. Now in Minnesota, we need at least a million people, according to the Minsure board, to sign up in order for this program to work and self-sustain itself. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that the premiums are going to be equally distributed among the people um, so that everybody can get care. Okay, fine. So two weeks into this program, $150 million of taxpayer money spent, and guess how many people have signed up? I think you already told me. Zero. Mm -hmm. Zero. We have, I brought some stats for you, 3,769 people are in the process of enrolling, but they can't get to the payment mm -hmm. portion of all of this. So some people don't even know how much it's going to cost them. Um, and other people, there is no payment mechanism in place. So even if you sign up for an account at this point, even if you want it, you can't get it. So we've had zero people, a mm -hmm. $150 million website later, and no one in Minnesota has signed up yet. And I think there are several other states that are not doing very well. I heard Delaware has one person that signed up. Right, Alaska's in trouble, Connecticut is in trouble. Mm -hmm. It's in the thousands, and remember we need millions of people to sign up nationwide in order for this thing to work. One of the questions I hope that our media um, would ask Governor Dayton well, the and the Democrats they here. Do. I know, right, because that would expose their bias, but um, what I would like for them to ask is how many people who are uninsured are signing up? Mm -hmm. um, once we get the 700,000 that are automatic, they have to be rolled over from other government programs in Minnesota. They have to automatically go into the MinSure program. How many of those um, outliers, in addition to that 700,000, are not currently insured? 
because remember that's who it's that's supposed to help. That's what the idea was, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're also hearing horrible stories now. If you got to follow me on Facebook and Twitter because I've been trying to get this out as much as possible. I know you say you're not you're not into it. I might get you there. I might I might get you a Twitter <laughs> account. Um, but the uh, the the real crux of it is. Um, there are so many people now coming up with stories and showing photos of screenshots of trying to sign up for this Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And their premiums are being doubled. Their mm -hmm. deductibles, that's the part that no one's talking about. Yeah. Remember, it's not just about the premiums. The premiums are going to be subsidized mm -hmm. by the government. So if you can't afford your premiums, you're going to be subsidized. Translate that. That mm. means other people will be paying to make up the difference for your premiums. Exactly. Um, but the true out-of-pocket expenses come from the deductibles. The deductibles we have found are skyrocketing now. Mm -hmm. um, individuals who used to pay a hundred and some odd dollars a month with a five thousand dollar deductible are now finding that their premiums are three hundred dollars a month and they have a ten thousand dollar deductible. I mean it's really astronomical the, the amount of money that, that is going to be mandated that they pay. And remember if they don't they get fined. Mm -hmm. And if they don't sign up and especially right here in Minnesota, if they don't sign up young, healthy people with these premiums and deductibles, then what's going to end up happening is the program itself can't sustain itself. And so then what, what happens after that? What happens after no one signs up and, and we still have a ton of uninsured people? That's a very interesting spot to be in, and I think we're going to get there because I don't think people want to sign up. No, or they don't know about it. Remember, political wonks like myself, I mean, I'm, I'm a political junkie, mm -hmm. right? I, I pay attention yeah. to these sort of things. You do too. Um, but there's a whole lot of people out there who don't. They, you know, they watch um, television shows in the evening to unwind from a really hard day at work, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily pay attention to all of the ins and outs and minutia of Obamacare. They, they don't care. I think if you did a man on the street at the University of Minnesota, and this is not to knock these, these students who wouldn't know that we've got a government shutdown right mm -hmm. now, they're just wrapped up in the things they should be wrapped up in, right? They're, they're trying to get good grades and trying to afford their books for next semester, mm -hmm. trying to make sure they and have enough money for gas. And skyrocketing, and exactly. I hear stories of lawyers that, you know, right now half of recent law school graduates are either unemployed or they're working at jobs that don't require that a awful? law degree, and they typically got debts of fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. And what do you think is going to happen to the doctors who are in the same boat? We're not going to have enough to go around. You add 30 million people nationwide right. into a system with the current number of doctors who happens to be dwindling, and mm. we're not going to get the same care. I know the doctor's going to take off. I remember being treated by a Canadian doctor some years ago at my the clinic where I go, and he, he was he, he'd moved south from Winnipeg because he was trying to escape uh, the Canadian health care system. That, of course, everyone touts from the left, right? Exactly. That they say mm -hmm. is such a wonderful program. Meanwhile, we have dignitaries coming into Minnesota and using the Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. because they, they know that our health care system here, as it stands, is better. It doesn't mean that we don't try to improve things, um, whether it's health care or any other system, but I just don't think we have to always turn to government laws and 2,000 page bills mm -hmm. to solve all of well, our problems. One of the things that I've noticed in the British health care system is that its care level has decreased dramatically. Yes, dramatically. And we've heard, we, there's been some horror stories on the internet, and I've seen these, sure. where people have died because of neglect by staff. And, and not just the internet, you know, I think sometimes we get wrapped up into what may or may not be true on social media, Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but follow real live news sources over there too, the Daily Mail, the Guardian, yeah. et cetera. Many of them have reported on these atrocities as well. Women That's giving right. birth in mm -hmm. hallways and people waiting for far too long for pacemakers mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so yes, I mean, I think that's where we're headed if I we don't I stop this thing. I think I once heard somebody who had taken a vacation in the British Isles and came back and said, I told them if I get sick, you ship me back. Immediately, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I have to tell you. Well, but there. who who would think that you'd have to make that kind of a provision? But yeah, you may as well, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to be and traveling the Canadians, overseas. When I go up, I, my wife's family comes from uh, Canada, and I visit them regularly, and. Uh, for the last several years, they've been having problems with their health care okay. system. And uh, it just seems that government control of health care just has a way of 
spiraling out of control and driving people out of the business. Right. Well, and name me one program where the government has successfully done something where it saves money, provides better service. Uh, can you name one entity that's done any um, any good? Um, I, I would even hesitate to say that there's probably some um, the military, fat. I would. I, but I think there's probably some fat we can trim off the military too, oh, yeah. right? And we mm -hmm. and we know now that we've gotten involved in far too many things all over the world. Um, and so I would say there's probably some fat to trim there too. It, it just, the bigger the government gets, the less all of us have our individual freedoms and liberties. And that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It really is about, I, I joked earlier, I said um, that before the cameras were rolling, if there was a party called the Leave Me Alone Party, I think that would be it. Just let me live my life and raise my kids. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that would be the way to go. But, you know, the best thing we've got at this point is the Republican Party, and I'll tout it all day long, that I think, um, you know, we can't survive on purity tests of 100%. So no, if I can't. agree with mm -hmm. you 80% of the time, 90% of the time, that was Ronald you've got Reagan's, my vote. Uh, if, you, if I agree with you 51% of the time, we're on the same side. Right. That was his approach. Well, I have, I have that's a little the only bit stricter one you can rule. Take. I, I have a little bit stricter rule. I think um, I'm more of a 75 25. Um, but at that, you know, mm -hmm. you got to remember every district, is, every district is different. Yep. Um, every office held is different and requires right. different things. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we're on a really good path here in Minnesota. We've got some fantastic activists. Um, people who are actually starting to get involved at the local level and make mm -hmm. changes locally, and that's so important. Before we quit, we only yeah. have a few minutes left. Uh, Boy, that time flew. Anyone, anyone watching this is going to say that she would make an excellent candidate. Have ah. you ever thought of that? <laughs> you know, I think I'm more of a, um, of a of a kingmaker versus a candidate. Um, I lack the filter sometimes that candidates need, um, and, what I, and do you I'm mean not by afraid. Filter? Well, I'm not always politically correct. If you follow my Twitter feed, you'll see that. Um, I don't hesitate to say that Michelle Obama should get off her duff and go out there and take care of her garden. All by her big girl self, she should go do that. Um, the media tends to run away with that and say that uh, I'm insensitive or don't like women or something. So, uh, no, I, I'm not a very good candidate, but I, I can help those candidates that are trying to do um, good and trying to sway this pendulum back in a conservative direction and really try to take control of the state. And by control of the state, I mean giving it back to the people. Give that control back to Minnesotans to say you they know best how to take care of their candidates. government should do as little as possible. As little as possible. So mm -hmm. I will help every candidate who has that as a mantra for sure. Well, that's great. I'm not sure everybody's going to buy the what you just said, that you wouldn't make a good candidate. You, you don't sound like <laughs> you'd you. make a bad candidate. Thank that's you. obvious. Uh, so what are you doing for this next year's election? We only sure. got one minute left, so why can you go quickly? One minute. Um, you know, I'm a political consultant, and I, I tend to um, find those causes, find those individuals that need help, and, and do the best I can to help them win elections. So I can't say that I won't do that again, because that's in my blood. Mm -hmm. um, but I also uh, dabble in writing some news on conservative daily news. I really like following um, uh, certain subjects like energy and um, things like that, so that folks can look for me on Twitter. I'm always pretty active there and pontificating. I think we're just about out of time, EJ. Thank you so much for Thank coming. Thank you so and much I, for having me. And I think there's a lot of people who are going to be still saying, boy, she'd make a great candidate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. See you next time.